tonight, Canadian women among the victims of rape and sexual abuse. The alleged perpetrator, a former British department store titan. I think Mohammed Afaid is a rapist. I think he's a serial rapist. The shocking accusations made in a new BBC documentary. Another blow to the federal liberals as their Quebec lieutenant steps down. He's felt it necessary to, I think, the citizen independent. I guess to get some political distance. With the confidence vote looming at issue, we'll be here with what it means and what could happen next. And a stolen Canadian treasure now back in Canadian hands. What's going through your mind? I'm still having a hard time. It's the real one. The roaring lion comes roaring home. From CBC News, this is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. Canadian women are among those making multiple allegations of rape and sexual assault against a late billionaire who often courted controversy. Egyptian-born Mohamed Al-Fayed died last year at the age of 94. For 25 years, he owned the iconic British department store Harrods. Now a new bombshell documentary from the BBC portrays him as a predator who searched store staff for young women he could arrange to meet in glamorous settings before allegedly preying on them. Briar Stewart is in London in front of the lavish emporium now at the centre of the controversy. Briar, can you take us through what you've learned? Well, Adrian, the Harrods department store is world-renowned. It's synonymous with luxury, but now it's embroiled in sexual assault allegations against its former owner, Mohamed al -Fayed. The BBC spoke to more than 20 women who said they were assaulted and in some cases raped. Among them were multiple Canadians. And you're romantic? Uh, absolutely, of course. In public, business mogul Mohammed Al Fayed appeared charming and well connected. But several women have come forward and told the BBC that behind his persona, the powerful billionaire was a sexual predator. I think Mohammed Al Fayed is a rapist. I think he's a serial rapist. Gemma, like other women BBC spoke with, did not want her full name revealed. She says she was raped by Al Fayed and that in 2009 she quit Herod, citing sexual harassment. She said the store agreed to a settlement as long as she signed a non-disclosure agreement and that transcripts she kept of their encounters, along with voicemails, were then ordered destroyed. I think they just wanted to get rid of it as quick as possible and get rid of me as quick as possible. The BBC reports that allegations circulated against Al Fayed for years, but he was never prosecuted. He sold Herod's in 2010 and died at the age of 94 in 2023. Muhammad, but you must call me Mumu. But before his death, his public profile grew even further. When I saw the state the villa was in, I said money is no object. He was portrayed in the hit series The Crown. His son Dodi Al Fayed was the boyfriend of Princess Diana. Both were killed in a car crash in Paris in 1997. Since BBC's documentary started airing Thursday morning, another woman, who also wanted to remain anonymous, has come forward with allegations. I was sexually assaulted by being groped by Al Fayed at his Park Lane apartment. And the legal team representing the women believes there could be other victims out there. In a statement, the current owners of Herod said they were utterly appalled by the allegations and say the current organization is nothing like the one that was controlled or owned by Al Fayed. So, Briar, at this point, where does it go from here? Well, Adrian, there is going to be a press conference tomorrow organized by the legal team of some of these women, and we do expect to hear from one of the Canadians. All right, Briar Stewart in London for us tonight. A revered portrait of Winston Churchill stolen from an Ottawa hotel is back in Canadian hands tonight. The exchange took place in Rome today. Paul Hunter was right there to capture the long-awaited moment of relief. And now is the moment I think we've all been waiting for for a very long time. And with that, at a ceremony inside the Canadian Embassy in Rome, up went the curtain and there it was. A Canadian treasure, a historic, freshly recovered Yusuf Karsh photo of the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. The Roaring Lion, as it's known, stolen from the walls of the Fairmont Chateau Laurier Hotel in Ottawa nearly three years ago, replaced by the thief with a fake and missing until police found it here in Italy. Now, 
the official signed handover from Italian authorities back to Canada. What's going through your mind? I, I'm still having a hard time. It's the real one. I, we're, it's exciting. I've never I, known I'm you to be speechless. speechless. <laughs> it's just, I, I'm still having a hard time to believe we're actually here in Rome and this is our portrait and we're gonna bring it back. Among those in the crowd, Nicola Cassinelli, an Italian who'd unwittingly bought the photo at an online auction long before police even knew it had been stolen. When he learned the truth, Cassinelli gave it up to Italian police. I'm happy that even if I enjoyed it privately for nearly two years in my living room now, visitors from all over the world will have the same opportunity in Ottawa, not in my home, but uh, it's nice that uh, it could happen again. This is the day that we've been working so hard uh, to get to. That's it. Ottawa police cracked the case with forensic clues, tips from the Karsh estate, and other evidence still not public. An Ontario man now faces multiple charges. Did you ever think you'd see this day? Um, I, I felt like we were. Uh, it was just going to take a long time. You know, I, ho I hope for one of two conclusions, either um, to charge the subject or recover the portrait. Sometimes we don't get to do both. And in this case, we have been able to, so I'm very happy. The photo itself is now headed home, stolen, sold, found, wrapped, and returned. What a journey. Of course, the journey's not over quite yet, Adrian. When it gets back to Canada, they're going to tidy it up, reframe uh, the portrait. And then in another ceremony, probably late next month, it'll officially go back up on the wall at the Chateau. So, Paul, we saw you speaking with the collector who bought the portrait, then surrendered it. That must have been a bit rough for him, eh? Yeah, but you know, he told me he knows this is a pretty big deal for Canadians, and that was a pretty big factor in why he had no hesitation in giving it back. But he also said, you know, look, there's another side to the story for him. At the end of the day, he's got a great tale to tell. No kidding. So do you. Paul Hunter in beautiful Rome. Thanks, Paul. To Ottawa now, where a top Liberal cabinet minister announced today he is leaving the government and the federal Liberal Party altogether. As Rafi Bujikanian explains, just days after a stinging by-election loss in Quebec, for the government, this is bad timing. Walking from the national capital to Quebec, it's not just physical distance Pablo Rodriguez is putting between himself and Ottawa. I am announcing that I have decided to enter the race to become leader of the Liberal, the Quebec Liberal Party, where it all began for me. No longer transport minister and prime minister Justin Trudeau's cabinet or his chief Quebec point man, Rodriguez is also quitting the federal Liberals to sit as an independent MP. Now I have the opportunity to set my own priorities. One of his own former cabinet colleagues has a slightly different take. He's felt it necessary to, I think, to sit as an independent. Uh, I guess to get some political distance. Aye. Trudeau has named Treasury Board President Anita Anand as the new transport minister, but Rodriguez's departure is not his only political headache. Dans une motion de non -confiance. Quebec Premier François Legault is leaning on the Bloc Québécois to vote in favour of a Conservative motion scheduled next week to bring down Trudeau's government. But so far, the Bloc leader is not going along. I never support Liberals. Help me God. I go against the Conservatives on a vote that is only about Pierre Poiliev and his huge ambition for himself. Fresh off a by-election loss to the Bloc Québécois in Montreal, the Liberals quickly announced the replacement for Rodriguez as their top Quebec organizer. We have a lot of work to do in the next year. Housing, dental care, farmer care, the national school food program, all of this is not yet in place. The government's survival for the next year is hardly guaranteed, but the NDP did announce on Thursday it also won't vote with the Conservatives to defeat the Liberals next week, giving Trudeau some reprieve. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. So coming up in about 20 minutes, Rosie and the Ad Issue panel look at the fallout from Rodriguez's departure and what the Conservatives need to do to actually bring down the government. Well, the leader of Lebanon's Iran-backed Hezbollah militia is blaming Israel for a wave of exploding electronic devices that's left a trail of deaths and severe injuries. Today, he called the attacks a declaration of war. 
And as Chris Brown shows us, Israel isn't backing down. Lebanon is rattled and panicked after experiencing the horror of everyday electronic devices suddenly becoming bombs, police were taking no chances, carrying out controlled explosions on anything suspicious looking. Of course we're scared, said Mustafa Sabai. Who can feel safe in this situation? Who can feel secure about their phone now? The toll of injured is now above 3,600, with Lebanese health authorities confirming 25 were killed in Wednesday's radio handset explosions, with 12 dead a day earlier from pagers. This trauma doctor said she's never encountered injuries like the ones she's been treating. So they had uh, puncture wounds on their faces, they had amputated limbs, they had open abdomens, intestines out, bowels out. Israel's government has not admitted it was behind what appears to be an unprecedented tampering operation. But most people in Lebanon are behaving like it was. Hezbollah's chief, Hassan Nasrallah, accused what he called the Zionist entity of violating every international law and red line. As he spoke, Israeli fighter jets flew low over Beirut and struck at targets in southern Lebanon. Hezbollah's attacks on northern Israel have driven tens of thousands of Israelis from their homes, but Nasrallah vowed the militia, which Canada considers to be a terrorist group, will not stop its strikes as they're in solidarity with Palestinians in Gaza. How Israel intends to capitalize on the chaos is also uncertain, even as the defense minister intensified his threats of further military action in what he called a new phase of the war. Some in Israel, though, are dismayed with that shift. We don't care about Hezbollah. War must be ended. Hostage families say getting their family members home should remain the priority, not Hezbollah. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Now, despite Israel shifting attention to its northern border with Lebanon, fighting continued on other fronts with consequences both deadly and disturbing. During an hours-long raid in the West Bank, Israeli forces reportedly killed at least four gunmen. After the battle, soldiers were seen pushing the bodies off a roof. Israel's military says it is investigating the incident and in Gaza. <laughs> this little guy cries for his father after a blast in Jabalia, an Israeli airstrike, according to local media, that killed seven members of a single family. The remains of the meal they were preparing left unfinished in the rubble. It was one of several airstrikes in Gaza today. After nearly a full year of war, the Gaza Health Ministry puts the death toll at more than 41,000. Well, here in Canada, BC RCMP say a fire that destroyed a historic bridge in Kamloops is being investigated as suspicious. The Red Bridge was engulfed in flames overnight. The damage so extensive, the structure collapsed into the river. It's the second fire at the bridge in just two days. The 88-year-old wooden crossing was the key link between Kamloops and the neighboring Tecumloops First Nation. Well, New Brunswick voters are heading to the polls next month. Premier Blaine Higgs made it official this morning. Kale Hounsell takes a look at the key issues shaping the election. <laughs> On his way to ask New Brunswick's lieutenant governor to kick off the election campaign, Blaine Higgs might be smiling, but the progressive conservative leader is in for a tough fight. Our goal is to make it cheaper for people to live here. With the campaign underway, Higgs is asking New Brunswickers for a third term, something no premier here has been able to do in nearly 30 years. At the same time, a new survey shows him with the lowest approval rating of any premier in Canada. He's also faced a revolt within his own party. The Shepherd, the CLA. Nearly half of the Tory candidates elected in 2020 have walked out on Higgs, many unable to support his stance on the controversial Policy 713. Protests have erupted over the policy, originally intended to protect transgender kids, but changed to require their parents' permission in order for teachers to use their preferred names and pronouns. We want families and parents to have the key role 
in, in raising their young children. I'm definitely going to be watching for um, the party's different takes on policy 713. This young trans person eligible to vote for the first time says he's worried about Higgs winning another election. I would honestly, I think I would consider moving just because I would not like the way that those policies would impact me. He's undecided between the Liberals and the Greens. The Greens had three seats at dissolution. The NDP has not been able to elect an MLA in New Brunswick in more than two decades. I think there is a lot of this campaign that will be focused on a referendum on Blaine Higgs. I think the Liberals have an opportunity probably to present a new vision. Still, Gilly says he thinks the core debate will be about those fundamental pocketbook issues. New Brunswickers go to the polls on October 21st. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Fredericton. There's concern in the academic community tonight after Ottawa announced more cuts to international student permits. Deanna Sumanek Johnson now with how some say the move could affect Canada's reputation as a leader in education. Once a foreign student himself, Matty Basiri now runs a popular tech platform that matches international students with Canadian institutions. He says the process has gotten harder. Now I wouldn't know if I'm going to Canadian colleges. Do I get my postgraduate work permit? Do I not get it? How the list is doing? Uncertainty amped up by Wednesday's announcement from Canada's Minister of Immigration. First of all, we will be lowering the target for study permits by 10 percent. Also newly added, restrictions around permits for master's and PhD students and proof of language proficiency. The announcement built on a move made by the government in January to drastically reduce the number of international students Canada takes in, saying the institutions were relying too much on foreign student tuitions and that those students were straining Canada's already scarce housing market. I would say that the measures that we've taken up to now are working. But some say the moves are also endangering Canada's reputation as the hub for the world's best and brightest. By Putting more restrictions and more uh, complications around applications for masters and PhD students, we're telling the world we're wavering in our commitment to attracting these highly talented students who we need to drive our economy in the future. New changes also affect Canada's colleges, where postgraduate work permits will now only be possible for students in programs linked to high demand labor markets. We're very concerned about this uh, change at a time when our country, more than ever, needs the, the makers, the builders, the growers. While institutions are asking where the shortfall in their funding will come from, Matty Basiri says he hopes there won't be more reductions and that new international students hoping to come to Canada can enjoy what he did, stability. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Doctors are getting a better grasp of what's behind a rare and deadly cardiac condition. Now I'm so gratified and so thrilled that the first test was working in humans. So see how the Canadian research so that could save lives. Patient? Plus, a 50-year-old UFO mystery immortalized by the Canadian Mint. There's such a, a strong feeling that something was there that, you know, it's, you can't ignore it. The sighting that put a Saskatchewan town on the map. And a memorable moment at a metal concert. He didn't expect anything, which was awesome. <laughs> perfect. We're back to Now take a look at this daring rescue of a driver in medical distress. Michigan police pulled up beside a vehicle weaving on a busy road. An officer climbed from her cruiser into his truck while both vehicles were still moving. The officer then safely stopped the vehicle. The driver was taken to hospital for further treatment. Now every year, about 60,000 Canadians experience sudden cardiac arrest. That's when the heart unexpectedly and abruptly stops. It's almost always fatal. Mike Crawley tells us how the deaths in one family helped lead Canadian researchers to a medical breakthrough. So this is my sister Jennifer. For decades, this a health mystery uh, surrounded Lauren Fillion's life and her siblings' deaths. Her sister died of a sudden cardiac arrest at 18. She had just finished high school. Her brother Peter collapsed and died at 34. 
newly married, just starting a family. And Fillion herself survived cardiac arrest in her early 30s. Out of the blue, uh, I was in a, an aerobics class at the time. Despite extensive cardiac testing on her and her family and DNA analysis, no one could pinpoint a cause. We had no answers for them and we had no idea whether or not we'd wake up the next day and we'd hear that a brother or sister had had a similarly tragic fate. Sudden cardiac arrest is triggered by problems with the heart's electrical system. These red arteries here. It's different from a heart attack, which stems from damage to heart muscle. In a sudden cardiac arrest, you're looking at, on average, one in 10 patients surviving. So it's pretty dismal. I know, here we go. It took years and an international search for similar cases to find out what was happening to Fillion and her siblings. Come on. The Canadian researchers who discovered it call it calcium release deficiency syndrome triggered by a variation in one gene known as RYR2. There was a lot of relief that now we had answers. The team's latest achievement? They figured out how to detect the syndrome on an ECG. So you see how different it is? The researchers hope this becomes part of the standard arsenal of cardiac tests when trying to find out who might be at risk and whose life could be saved by having a defibrillator implanted. Now I'm so gratified and so thrilled that the first test was working in human. It's kind of bittersweet. Um, you know, obviously I'm ecstatic that, you know, somebody else isn't going to lose a brother, sister, mom or dad, or a child. You know, obviously it hurts that it came at the cost of, you know, my brother and sister. Rusty, come. Fillion's children and her two surviving brothers have all been tested. None of them have the syndrome. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Ilderton, Ontario. A close encounter on a Canadian farm is now enshrined on a Canadian coin. Definitely there was something spinning in that grass. We'll take you back to the scene of the 50-year-old sighting. And after the break, Rosie's here with that issue. Hello, Rosie. Hey, Adrian. Tonight we're going to talk about the Conservatives' non-confidence vote and what they need to try and get support for it. No, we're not going to play Pierre Polyev's silly games. What else could the Conservatives do to try and get the support to bring down the government? Chantal, Althea and Andrew join me to talk about that and more. The moon is about to get some temporary company. Starting September 29th, a small asteroid will orbit Earth as a second or mini moon. It won't be visible to the naked eye, only through professional telescopes. Scientists say it will return to its home in an asteroid belt by the end of November. And a galactic encounter on a Saskatchewan farm is being commemorated on a new Canadian coin. The strange sighting drew international attention 50 years ago. And as Alexander Silberman shows us, it's now part of a small town's UFO folklore. We were shocked. Leo Four remembers the unexplainable sighting like it was yesterday. Definitely there was something spinning in that grass. In the morning of September 1st, 1974, his brother Edwin Fuhr reported seeing five silver flying saucers hovering in his canola field, leaving behind what looked like donut-shaped imprints before taking off into the sky. Oh, I thought, well, what the heck, you know, maybe my brother was seeing things and that. But until I saw the, uh, the rings, <laughs> seeing is believing. Those mysterious circles thrust the tiny town of Langenberg, Saskatchewan in the spotlight, drawing international news coverage and UFO enthusiasts from around the world. A story compelling enough for the federal government to test soil samples and an RCMP investigation, but resulting in no conclusions. The local paper is full of stories about whether the tiny prairie town is being invaded by aliens. Talk of those memories now rekindled. The so-called Langenberg event is getting recognized with a new commemorative coin. And that unexplained morning wasn't the last UFO sighting in town. The local paper reported on two other incidents seven years later. Nothing is totally confirmed at all, but there's such a, a strong feeling that something was there that, you know, it's, you can't ignore it. Fuhr's nephew now farms the same land. Those crop circles, long gone, but not the idea that something unusual happened here. It's always in the back of your head. Sometimes the hair will stand up on the back of your neck thinking about it. His uncle was the only person at the farm who witnessed the strange events, but his family and many in Langenberg 
fully believe the story, even though they'll likely never know what happened in this field 50 years ago. Alexander Silberman, CBC News, Regina. Now let's break down the week in politics. Rosie's here with that issue. At issue this week, a test of confidence. The Conservatives are making their first attempt at trying to bring down the government, but so far have no other party to help them. No, we're not going to play Pierre Polyev's silly games. I go against the Conservatives on a vote that is only about Pierre Polyev. Pierre Polyev fired back. It's time for the Bloc and the NDP to stop boosting carbon taxes and protecting this costly Prime Minister. So what do the Bloc and NDP's positions tell us? How will the Conservatives manage to win another party over? I'm Rosemary Barton, here to break it down on At Issue. Chantal Bear, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, nice to see you all. This week feels like about, about a year uh, has passed <laughs> already, and it's only Thursday. Um, uh, Chantal, let, let's start with you. So the, the confidence vote is happening next week, sooner, I think, than people expected, perhaps. Um, but it already seems as though we know what the outcome will be. What, what did you make of sort of the posturing of the past couple of days? One, it doesn't seem uh, this vote will not pass. Nothing will happen between now and Wednesday that will give Mr. Poiliev support for his uh, confidence motion. It's coming up early because the Liberals, who have uh, control over the parliamentary mm -hmm. agenda <laughs> and who have to allocate a set number of uh, opposition days to the opposition parties to present motions like this, uh, decided rather wisely to do so at the earliest opportunity. Uh, before a lot of grievances have piled up on the other two sides, etc. Um, what happened next is, was quite predictable. I think Mr. Blanchet from the Bloc Québécois never uh, made it a secret that he does not interpret his victory, uh, quite a victory, in uh, La Salle et Verdun, a West Island uh, or West Montreal riding that the Bloc never wins usually, as a cue to help Mr. Poiliev become prime minister, yeah. especially with a majority. So the answer from the Bloc, when the Bloc makes that move, it's going to find a Quebec issue that people can relate to, to go there. They're not going to make it easier for Pierre Poiliev when every poll here shows that um, Quebecers, 44 percent, think the worst case scenario in an election uh, federally would be Pierre Poiliev becoming prime minister. So do the math. As for the NDP, I never believed that the NDP would support anything that would bring down the government before the BC election is over yeah. at the end of October. I did notice Blanchet say today, though, Andrew, um, I'm not doing it now, but like talk to me in October. M maybe, maybe things will change. And I imagine that's his his leverage with the government to try and extract more for. In this case, he's asking for more for yeah. seniors. First of all, I agree with Chantal that it was a good move for Liberals to bring on the vote because they know that all three parties are not going to vote at the same time to bring them down. Not today, not tomorrow, not, I suspect, for a long time to come. Um, we know the Conservatives want to have a vote. At least they say they do. I, I'm not even sure the Conservatives want to have a, a, an election this week. I don't think anybody does, but, you know, <laughs> they'd like to have one pretty soon. Uh, so you have to get the other two parties, the Bloc and the NDP, to vote together to bring the government down. Well, why would they? When the Bloc is up, the NDP is typically down and vice versa. The Bloc, as Chantel said, uh, you know, they, they could take or leave it, if you will, on election. They'll take an election on their terms. They're not in any great hurry, but they're not afraid of it either. They're basically at more or less the same point in the polls that they've been for several years, 32, 33 percent in the polls. They might win a few, few more seats if an election were held today, but not a huge upside for them. But they'll bide their time. They'll show a statesmanlike readiness to entertain offers from the Liberals. Uh, when they feel that they can no longer extract any more, then they might feel they're ready to go. That leaves the NDP. Well, the NDP uh, doesn't want to have an election anytime soon, to say the least. Uh, they did not badly in the, in the by-elections, but they're sagging in the polls. They've got hardly anybody nominated. They're way behind in the fundraising. So they would like to put it off as long as possible, frankly. Now, you might say, well, if the bloc votes uh, just declines to vote no confidence this time. Maybe that gives the NDP a free kick. Yeah. Except the trouble is you can't really take back a no confidence vote. Once you said you've lost confidence That's in the right. government, you've lost yeah. confidence. Yeah. So unless they're prepared to keep on voting no confidence right. after this one, then they don't want to get into that. And of course, if they keep on voting no confidence, at some point the bloc's going to agree with them and they're into That's an election they don't want. That's right. They've painted themselves into, they would paint themselves into a bit of a corner doing it that way. Um, Althea, is this just as Monsieur Blanchet described it accurately this week, a four cars playing chicken, and that's what we're going to be now for 
until we get to an election. Yes. <laughs> um, in fact, what's been really refreshing, I think, <clears throat> is that you have uh, Yves-François Blanchet, who uh, doesn't usually tend to have that many Anglophone, like, rest of Canada journalists yeah, attending his yeah. press conferences. And all of a sudden, there's all this interest. And he's, like, a straight talker who kind of just says it the way it is. And there, I agree with everything Chantal and Andrew just said. Mm. I think there are other reasons at play, too. I think the Liberals and the Bloc played their hands wisely. I'm not sure I would say that the NDP necessarily has. I think they overshot in their rhetoric perhaps because of by-election sure. positioning. Yeah. But it's really hard to say you've lost confidence in somebody and then come back and say, well, actually, I'm going to vote that I have confidence in them a week later. That's mm -hmm. a bit tricky. But I agree with Andrew's point. If they didn't vote um, you know, with the government now, when there's actually a Pharmacare bill that is about to be passed in the Senate that isn't law yet, how could they ever go back and say, uh, well, uh, now we have confidence in the government, even though we didn't have confidence in them two weeks yeah. ago. Um, I think the bloc was super smart to come out very quickly. I didn't expect them to come out, you know, a day after the government announced that they were going to put, allow the uh, conservative opposition to put forward this non-confidence vote so early. Um, the bloc came out and basically squeezed the NDP and tried to squeeze the NDP. Mr. Melsha was very clear yeah. in his language, yeah. kind of daring the NDP um, to go back on their words and to stay in their corner. And his whole goal was basically to be the only partner the Liberals could have. And then he would have the Liberals by the juggler, yeah. uh, that he would be able to get things, more things that he wanted. And yeah. so far, his negotiations have started pretty slim. He's asking for a few things. Supply management bill that is in the Senate that the senators don't like because it ties the hand of a future foreign affairs minister to negotiate away supply management. The other thing that the bloc wants um, is a boost, a 10% boost to old age security uh, for seniors that are 65 to 74. Yeah. The Liberals boosted the pension uh, in budget 2021, but only for those over 74. And in order to do that, the government has to agree to allow an opposition MP to bring forward a money bill, which is an incredibly rare thing to do. And that bill has been languishing in the House of Commons since March mm -hmm. because the government has refused to do that. So Mr. Yeah. Blanchet has said, <clears throat> he actually said on CBC, I think I'm going to give them some time, basically yeah. a month, yeah. Yeah. and maybe in October I'll defeat them. It's also, now, very exp it's also very expensive ask, that part of it. The, the about BYS $10 billion, I yeah, remember, yeah, if yeah. I remember correctly. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but, but he's not asking about immigration. You know, he's not asking right. things that the, you know the federal government would not give them. Uh, Chantal. Uh, what's interesting about the, the ask on pensions is that uh, it's not a Quebec-only bill. Uh, the That's right. the, the That's right. boost in old age security would apply across the board to all seniors. Uh, but what's also interesting pertaining to cost is that in the House of Commons, the Conservatives supported it, along with yep. the NDP. Yeah. So uh, it's hard to make a case that uh, Mr. Blanchet is asking a Quebec-only uh, yep. uh, big money <laughs> bill to buy off his support. I think he acted swiftly this week because he's playing the long game, as yep. opposed to many of the players we're seeing, in the sense that <clears throat> when he does not say quickly that the bloc is not going to vote for a non-confidence motion, the government will have to take it seriously uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, because he will not. The, the message was, I'm not going to play poker uh, on this. Uh, yeah. But when I do s say I'm thinking about supporting this, you're going to have yeah. to take me to my word. And I also think it's just because he was super confident after Monday, so he's ready to kind of <laughs> show all that yes, confidence uh, in Ottawa. Uh, yeah. also, just a point on, yeah. the, on that. Uh, it, it, Andrew is not wrong about the bloc being at 30, 34, but the, the way the vote is splitting is really good for the bloc. Yeah, that's right. And if you look yeah. at their numbers in Francophone Quebec, they're poised to take the Liberals off that, that board. In Thanks. the next election, that could even translate into official opposition for the bloc. But, wow, Andrew. But you don't want to look too eager. No. Uh, you, you don't want to go when you're ready to go necessarily as when the public's ready to go. You want to look like you've been forced into it. You want to present yourself as the soul of reason who want, just wants to make this parliament work. Yeah, and yeah. yet these other players are playing politics and I'm finally forced, <laughs> forced to bring this government down. <laughs> so he doesn't need to do that this week. He sets himself up better for the day when he eventually wants to do it. 
by doing things like this, where he says, look, I, I supported the government until I could no longer have the option. Very quickly, Chantal, very quickly. And in the case of the Bloc, it's got more uh, room to maneuver on that score because Quebecers, by and large, are not pining for, yes, for yes. a Pierre Poilievre government. Uh, right. The situation here is really different. Uh, and, and so the notion that Quebecers are in a hurry to get Pierre Poilievre as prime minister uh, is, is a non-starter, actually. Yeah. Dislike of Poiliev is boosting the uh, BQ numbers these days. Okay, we're going to leave this part there. That was very, very fascinating, though. And when we come back, we'll take a look at the current state of the Liberal Party. Obviously, it would have been nicer to uh, be able to, uh, to uh, win and hold uh, Verdun, but um, there's more work to do. So losing a by-election in a safe riding, a key Quebec MP stepping down. How's the Liberal Party responding to a brutal week? That's next. It's been a brutal few days for the Liberals. They lost to Quebec's stronghold in the by-election. Uh, obviously, it would have been nicer to uh, be able to, uh, to uh, win and hold uh, Verdun, but um, there's more work to do, and we're going to stay focused on doing it. And now their Quebec lieutenant is stepping down. I have decided to enter the race to become leader of the Liberal, the Quebec Liberal Party. So how's the Liberal Party responding to a challenging week, let's call it that. Uh, can they bounce back? Here to talk more, Chantal, Andrew, and Althea. Althea, let's start with you. Um, I mean, Monday seems like a month ago, but <laughs> but you, you take Monday on top of this decision by Pablo Rodriguez, which has been, you know, an open secret here in Ottawa for some time. It doesn't make for a great week again for, for the Liberals. No, but they're not related. Pablo Rodriguez no, has right. been a Liberal MP since 2004. I mean, it doesn't look like the Liberal government's going to form uh, government again in the next election. He wants a new challenge. It's completely understandable that he would want to go try to, you know, mount his leadership bid for the Quebec wing of the party. The fact that he's sitting as an independent is actually good for him. It's good for the government. The Liberal Party federally and provincially are not actually the same party. So it allows Mr. Poiliev to take different public stance than the federal government might take. Um, the by-election is a big a big loss and it should not be underestimated but the PMO and the party did a really good job at the caucus in Nanaimo last week mm -hmm. of basically lowering expectation from MPs telling them that they were going to lose that they should prepare to lose that even if they lost the prime minister was not going to go anywhere so you didn't have that like heightened anxiety that we saw after yeah. Toronto St. Paul's uh, back in June when they lost another safe liberal stronghold. But it is very concerning that the none of the above vote is going to the Bloc Québécois. Part of that writing did go Bloc, like back in 2008. Yeah. About half that, that writing was a Bloc seat for a bit. But both parts of that writing went uh, NDP orange in 2011. So it is really concerning. I think they actually thought they had a chance of winning because there were people spinning like... Melanie Jolie's team is out there and they're going to yeah, like bring yeah. this home and then it didn't well, I mean, happen. It was, yeah, it was, it was close and there was, there was I think two it or three close. times where it was tied. But it should not have been No, it should close. not have been close. No, if you fair. lose this yeah. seat, if you lose yeah. Toronto St. Paul's, yeah. What's that's left yeah, on the sure. electoral well, map, well, and that's what sure. MPs are thinking about. Chantal, Chantal, it, and it's not only that. The, this, like Toronto St. Paul's, was one by-election, which allowed the party to pour yeah. enormous yeah, amounts exactly, of yeah. resources sure. in what would have been considered a few years ago safe liberal seats where mm -hmm. you put no extra resources. Right, right. And despite having put all those resources, ministers on the ground, boots uh, from Ottawa and from everywhere on the ground, they still could not keep it. Uh, one. Two, I don't think the Liberals totally understand that what this confirms, and the polls do show that, is that since Toronto St. Paul's, they have lost Quebec. The, their situation has become marginally worse. They were behind everywhere, but not in Quebec until the beginning of the summer, and now they are well behind the bloc across Quebec. Uh, and that basically means they have nowhere else yeah, uh, to look left. to. And yeah, I'll yeah. give you my theory as to why they lost Quebec. Yes, I think please. over the summer, Quebecers realized that the Liberals had lost the rest of Canada. Mm. And on that basis, since Pierre Poilievre is not at this point attracting very many votes in Quebec, uh, they decided to turn to, you know, go back behind the barricades. Yeah, and the that would be the Bloc yeah. Québécois. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that tells me that the only way for the Liberals to come back up in Quebec <coughs> is to come back up outside Quebec. 
which I don't know how they do at this point, but Andrew, you. <laughs> well, I'll say, first of all, it's not just La Salle ever done. Uh, in Elmwood, Transcona, the Liberal candidate got 4.8% of the vote. Yeah. I believe I'm correct in saying that's the third worst result for a governing party in a by-election in the history of Canada. Uh, there's only been two worse. Uh, so that's not encouraging either. Um, and so uh, I've been delving into the numbers a little bit. You can't find a, a governing party that's been this far behind. They're now an average of 20 points behind in the polls for this long. They've been 15 to 20 points back for more than a year. With this little time left before the election, you can't find that until you, unless you go back to the last days of Brian Mulroney mm. uh, or the last days of, uh, of uh, Louis Saint Laurent before the, the Diefenbaker sweep of 58. So the, the, neither of those augurs well no. uh, for the governing party. In other words, to come back from this, <clears throat> they'd have to do something that's never been done in Canadian history before under a leader who is now underwater in terms of the approval ratings by 39 points. Uh, to, to take up Chantal's point about them losing the last bastion in Quebec, that's also perhaps the last argument for Justin Trudeau staying on is that he can save the furniture in Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, if he's not even going to do that, uh, you know, on balance, I've been one of those who've argued that, well, maybe it's better to lose with the guy you have rather than yeah, somebody yeah. new. Yeah. Um, at some point, the argument can flip that, 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 uh, um, that anything would be better than this. Yeah, if you're going to get wiped out, then the argument fl fl Quickly, Chantal. Uh, yes, but uh, I think what's also happening, and it goes back to what Althea was saying about the name, is that people who want to be liberal leaders, uh, his successor, are now thinking maybe it's better to let him sink. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. if we're going to take a sinking ship, you know the Liberal Party, they're not big on second chances. So I, I think that is also what is shoring up Mr. Trudeau, despite all the evidence that this ship is sinking. But what do they do if he decides to go in spite of them? <laughs> I think the party will be asking to stay on, but he's not necessarily the, guy, the kind of guy who puts the team before himself. Last quick word, Althea. I'm not sure that the party will be asking him to stay on if he decides that he wants to go. I think a lot of caucus, I would venture to say the majority of caucus would like him to make that decision on his own accord. They feel like they are helpless. They're not, but they feel that they are helpless in shoving him out the door. And none of the uh, internal caucus members, the cabinet ministers who do want the job, are actively pushing him out. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that is not helping the, you know, backbench okay. MPs who want to see the leader gone. I saw somebody, it might have been one of your stories, Althea, anonymous source, uh, doing a Nancy Pelosi and saying, he's got to make up his mind quick whether he's going to stay or go <laughs> after he's just said, I'm staying. <laughs> okay, I got to leave it there. There'll be lots more to talk about. Thank you for putting the, the week so far in perspective. Now I'll send things back to Adrian in Toronto. All right, thanks, Rosie. Up next, a high stakes intermission during a live concert. I was just worried that the crowd was going to be upset that I was interrupting the show. <laughs> the metal marriage proposal in our mind. You are looking at a couple of music lovers showing their love for each other by getting engaged on stage during a metal concert for a band called Green Lung. So the proposal happened in front of a sold out crowd in Toronto that paused to cheer them on. And tonight, their moment is our moment. I just on a whim reached out to the band, just asked if they would help me propose. Jared and Jacob, are you here? I knew that it was one of his favorite bands and it all just kind of fell together. Uh, and he didn't expect anything, which was <laughs> perfect. I was just worried that the crowd was gonna be upset that I was interrupting the show. That's what I've always loved about the metal community is it's always just been so inclusive and so welcoming and so like everyone is accepted. It doesn't matter who you are. The whole room popped up. It was probably the biggest cheer of the night, which, you know, as a front man made me envious. I wish you guys all the best and I look forward to seeing pictures of the wedding. And if Green Lung is not on the wedding playlist, um, yeah, you'd be getting a strongly worded email. I was so appreciative that they were willing to accommodate us because I knew it would be really important to Jared. Yeah, it was just like wonderful. <laughs> That's amazing. And you know, the band was prepared. The vocalist said, just in case the proposal did not go the way they wanted it, they had a song about depression lined up, but they got to play a love song after anyway. 
Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.